Um, so welcome everyone to our event, uh, the, the Far Right in New Brunswick, a panel on extremism and exclusion. Uh, my name is Tracy Glenn, and I'm one of the editors with the MB Media Co-op. So this event uh, tonight is being hosted by the MB Media Co-op and Societe de la Cadie de Nouveau Brunswick, SMB. So I want to begin by acknowledging that we, the organizers, are on the unceded territories of either the Wollstokway or the Mi'kmaq. Uh, so before I introduce tonight's event, uh, Wollstok Grand Council Chief Ron Tremblay, a strong champion of the Wollstokway language and culture, will welcome us to this event. Uh, Ron, I'm just going to. Wait, greetings. Uh, I'm going to first of all uh, speak the language, the original language of this land, Awalastogook, um, which is uh, uh, the land of the people of the beautiful and bountiful river. Klazikul payud Awalastogook. Good to be Archiopa. Gilwa Genzo was a good one, a little good the egg. She ban oak, don't ask no, but ski ask no, glot the glass no. The god, the glass with skick the meg, me talks with with a gisk. Most of them with whisper that was said, most of them with me bow said. Um, and ball of you, uh, chkobotic, not jibbly gacking in and missing the mean and gigi hin and with joking in and a loose egg, you pull a walk in that way out. Um, that we blows well to walk to the mouse of walking middle age and age and age and age. I I um, asked the, the ancestors of this of the four sacred cardinal uh, directions of the east, the south, the west, and the north to come join us today, uh, um, to guide us and to direct us and to heal us and and and, and to teach us today. Um, we are just merely uh, human beings, you know, walking here on uh, with this great earth. I'm called our our mother, and, and I in, in, invited our, our great mother earth and all that's within her and and on her that 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 sustains life. All, all the water systems, the rivers, the brooks, the streams, the marshes, the oceans, the lakes, and all the animals. The four-legged, uh, the swimmers, the flyers, and 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 the creepy crawlers, and also the forest, and 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 all the mountains and the rocks and the valleys, and and I asked our, our great the father, this uh, the sky, and our great grandfather, the sun, and our great grandmother, the moon, to come and uh, direct us tonight, as as we sit here in in either. Wolostog homeland or Migama or 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 the Passamaquoddy homeland. And at the end I said uh, middle age, middle age, middle age, middle age. And that means uh, let that be so. Let that be so. Let that be so. So when Um, thank you, Ron, only one. Uh, so tonight's event is a result of a collaboration between the MB Media Co-op and SAMB to enhance cross-cultural dialogue in the province on matters that affect all of us, including language, culture, politics. Uh, the MB Media Co-op is a volunteer-run grassroots media outlet devoted to media for social justice. SAMB is an organization dedicated to defending and promoting the rights and interests of the province's Acadian and Francophone community. So both organizations are member-based and if you'd like to join either organization, we welcome that and you can find information on how to join us on our websites. So first you may be wondering why this event co-hosted by SAMB uh, is in English. Um, SAMB reached out to us at the MB Media Co-op to be part of extending the conversation on bilingualism in the Anglophone community in New Brunswick. Uh, the MB Media Co-op stories on bilingualism have been some of our most popular stories. The, the Media Co-op also publishes stories about efforts to save the Wollstokway language and culture, including efforts to change the name of the St. John River back to its original name, the Wollstok. Uh, so our event tonight is timely. It will discuss the politics of extremism and exclusion as the provincial and federal governments both embark on reviews of legislation on official languages. 
Also, SAMB will be organizing a mirror event to this event en français soon as part of their Paral UR series. So stay tuned for details on that from both our organizations. Uh, so before introducing tonight's speakers, I also want to give a special shout out of thanks to the people who conceived the idea for tonight's event. So Ali Chasson, Eric Dow, and Alex Doucette with SAMB, Susan O'Donnell with the MB Media Co-op, and I also want to thank the media co-op folks who are providing logistical support tonight, Adi Rao, Matthew Hayes, and Christy Elaine. <laughs> um, I now have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speakers, uh, Bryn uh, Trofomic and Shana Perry are both MA students studying sociology at the University of New Brunswick. So they're gonna talk about their research on the nature of right-wing extremism in Atlantic Canada. And then their presentation will be followed by Gilbert McLaughlin, a postdoctoral researcher at the Center of Hate, Bias and Extremism at Ontario Tech University. And he will discuss the nature of right-wing extremism and exclusion in the anti-bilingualism movement in New Brunswick, including in rhetoric found in last year's provincial election. So following the presentations, we will be joined by discussants, Wollstock Grand Council Chief Ron Tremblay, who has worked tirelessly on preserving the Wollstock way language, Husoni Raymond with Black Lives Matter Fredericton, Serge Brudeau, Vice President of uh, La Société de la Cadie de Nouveau Brunswick, SAMB, and David Hoffman, Associate <coughs> Professor of Sociology at the University of New Brunswick, whose research interests include right wing extremism in Atlantic Canada. So these four discussants will engage the presenters with a question or comment, and then we hope to have enough time to go to the audience for a few questions. Um, so you can ask your questions and make comments throughout the event in the chat room on Zoom or on Facebook, where this event is also being live stream. Uh, we have folks monitoring both chat rooms. Uh, we recognize that the issues being talked about tonight are contentious and will likely spark a lively debate. We ask that you keep your comments respectful and any offensive remarks or just respectful participants will be removed. So um, if we don't get to addressing your question or comment tonight too, we hope to continue the conversation soon and we'll make every attempt to connect with you. Uh, we're covering a lot of ground tonight, but we wanted to bring together the presenters and discussants in a conversation that makes some bridges. So we welcome hearing your feedback too on where we should take uh, tonight's conversation. So get in touch with us. Uh, so tonight's event is being recorded and will be published on the MB Media Co-op's website for later viewing and we will not record the question and answer session. Uh, so without further ado, I will now turn it over to, to Bryn and Shana. Excellent, okay, um, I'm gonna hide you guys here. So thank you guys so much for coming. It's really encouraging to see so many people uh, interested in this topic um, and in this type of research. Uh, so my name is Bryn Trafmuk. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a MA student at the University of New Brunswick. And my research interests for my thesis lie in misogynist terrorism and understanding the role that misogyny plays in mass murder and mass violent events. But I'm also a research assistant on this project here, which is looking at right-wing extremism in Canada, as well as in Atlantic Canada more specifically. And this project was uh, done in collaboration with Dr. David Hoffman, who's sitting on the panel tonight, as well as with Shana Perry, who's gonna present after me on some of her research about right-wing extremism in the Canadian Armed Forces, as well as with, as with an extra RA, uh, Caitlin hislot Mardinson. And so, let me see here, I wanna go to the next slide. Um, this, the research that I'm gonna to present to you tonight and our results come mostly from this uh, article here that we recently published in Dynamics of Asymmetric Con Conflict. Um, and so in this article, we looked at the extent, breadth and type of right-wing extremism in Atlantic Canada um, with a goal of better understanding what's going on out there. So if you're interested in anything that I mentioned or talk about tonight, um, you can go give the article a read as well um, because I just, I don't have the time in 15 minutes to cover everything that, that, we, went, that we went over in detail in the article. So it's a, something you could read as well for more information. Um, and before I start specifically into Atlantic Canada, I think it's really important to understand kind of the context of right-wing extremism currently in Canada, as well as globally. Um, and really what researchers have found um, lately um, is that an increase in right-wing extremism, particularly post 2016 and kind of a, a shifting climate of right-wing extremism. And really this is something that researchers don't yet fully understand why it's happening and something that needs to be researched further. 
Um, it's really a complex kind of socio-political environment. But one of the things that we're seeing kind of concurrently with this rise in right-wing extremism is a, is a growing normalization of hate. And we're seeing that in the United States with Donald Trump and a, a vilification of Islam, ban on Muslim immigrants, um, an attempt to build a wall to keep out Mexicans. Um, and his, uh, he refused to uh, condemn white supremacy as well. But this is also something that we've seen in Canada um, over recent years with Prime Minister Harper uh, viewing Islamicization as the greatest threat to Canada, as well as with Kelly Leach uh, attempting to screen for Canadian values from immigrants um, before they would be allowed into Canada. Um, and this has also become a growing issue globally with um, uh, far right uh, populist and nationalistic politicians being elected kind of worldwide. So it's not just a Canadian or Atlantic Canadian or United States problem, but really we're seeing kind of a global acceptance of hate. Um, and really in line with this, um, Perry and Dr. Barbara Perry and Dr. Ryan Scrivens did uh, a really, really great study prior to this one, looking at right-wing extremism across Canada from 1980 through to 2015. And what they saw was in this time frame by Islamist extremists, which were really kind of the focus of security forces um, preventing attacks by Islamic extremists, there were eight violent incidents between 1980 and 2015. But in comparison, their research found that in the exact same time frame, there was 120 or even more than 120 uh, violent incidents by right wing extremists. And so some of these violent incidents include Justin Bork in 2014. Um, this one hits really close to home for all of us in New Brunswick um, when he killed three in Moncton. But also outside of Atlanta, Canada, we saw Alexander Bucinet in 2017 uh, with the Quebec Moss shooting. And more recently in 2018, we see uh, Alec Manassian who killed 10 in the Toronto van attack, who also falls underneath the kind of umbrella of far right or right wing extremism, really highlighting kind of the, the real and present threat and danger that right wing extremism can pose um, to Canadians and to national security. So if we turn now to look at our work on right wing extremism in Atlantic Canada, we examine incidents of right-wing activity or far-right activity, I should say, um, in Atlantic Canada for a period of 20 years between January 2000 to December 2019, so about 20 years. And we looked at uh, collecting information on incidents that happened as well as actors and groups that were available. And we also had a particular interest in examining the relationship between rurality and certain types of right-wing activity. And this was bore kind of out of previous research that had been done that found that there's an urban effect uh, to right-wing extremism in Canada. So that right-wing extremist activity is tending to happen in urban areas. And we wanted to see if this would hold true in Atlantic Canada, which is some of the more rural parts of Canada. And so that was something we were interested in. And just to plug our research again, this is was recently published in Dynamics of Asymmetric Conflict. So you can go read the entire article there. Um, and what did we find? Uh, in total, we identified within the 20 year time frame 161 unique incidents of right wing extremist activity in Atlantic Canada. And of these, you can see them distributed here by year. And what this really shows is the um, that post 2016 kind of boom in right wing extremism. Um, we found empirical support for that even in Atlantic Canada. So you can really see over here on this side of the graph. Um, the, the dramatic increase. So 104 of our 161 incidents, which is about 65% of the incidents, took place post 2016, uh, providing that empirical support to the 2016 boom. And you even see um, an even larger increase between 2017 and 2018. Um, we see quite a large increase there as well. And then we looked at um, really the different, I know this is a busy and colorful graph, but really uh, the takeaway from this is the, the types of incidents that have been increasing over past years that we're interested in. Uh, the first being in yellow here, protests and rallies. We've seen a large increase in, in those happening in Atlantic Canada. And then specifically, we found that these fall along kind of four themes, these protests and rallies um, being anti-immigration, anti-globalization, anti-Indigenous, as well as anti-government focused specifically on, or mostly on Justin Trudeau. And then we also saw a large increase in the brown here in group meetings and group formations over the past years, as well as smaller increases in property crimes and harassment and hate speech. 
When we looked at the incidents uh, across the provinces, Nova Scotia had the most with 74, but this was really followed closely by New Brunswick with 64, which we thought was an interesting finding given that New Brunswick has a smaller population than Nova Scotia and that New Brunswick's urban centers are less populous than uh, most of Nova Scotia's urban centers. So for there to be a difference of only 10 incidents here, we thought was, was an interesting trend. And following that through a comparison of New Brunswick to Nova Scotia to this graph, we see that New Brunswick actually had more group meetings than Nova Scotia, as well as more protests than Nova Scotia over the 20 year period that we were looking. And they were very, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia were very similar in terms of property crimes as well. Um, and this one, we can also see that property crimes were the most frequent or most common type of incident that we uh, found with uh, 45 in total. So that's about 30% of all incidents were property crimes. And mostly the property crimes that we were seeing were vandalism that was meant to intimidate a targeted group. So something like spray painting hate symbols, um, we saw that on a lot of churches, um, as well as on a few kind of election signs, was, was what we were seeing broadly for property crime. And then we, me and Dr. Hoffman specifically attended a uh, rural issues conference in April of 2019. And we got some really good feedback from that conference. And they suggested that we look at right-wing extremism uh, across uh, different language areas. So to see if there were different trends in right-wing extremism um, in predominantly French or predominantly English areas um, and see if there were any patterns there or if potentially like linguistic tensions played a role in right-wing extremism. Um, and so what we found was that right-wing extremism was predominantly taking place in English areas. Um, more than 85% was in English areas with a smaller amount in mixed areas and only one of the incidents that we located in French areas. Um, and really to fully understand why we're seeing this, we would need to do more research and look more into it. Um, we can speculate that maybe it has something to do with cultural differences between French and English areas, um, potentially that there is a stronger group identification among French Canadians. Um, but it could also be that the English areas of their study are the more urban areas. So we're seeing an urban effect or that um, of all the provinces, uh, New Brunswick is the only bilingual province, so that could also play a role in why we see this trend in our results. And then here we can see that the urban effect that I talked about earlier, that um, it's tending to take place in urban areas. This is also holding true in Atlantic Canada, which is more rural, um, with the bulk of our incidents taking place in urban areas. Um, and what we see here is with postering and with recruitment, while we had less than 10 incidents of postering and recruitment um, each respectively, it was 100% committed in urban areas. So we found no incidents of postering and no incidents of recruitment taking place in rural areas, um, which was uh, an interesting finding. And as well, the, the urban effect held true for every type of incident that we looked at with the exception of discrimination, where discrimination is almost a 50-50 split between rural and urban areas. Um, and as I mentioned, we didn't just look at incidents, we also looked at the number of groups that were active, as well as the number of individuals that were active in the Atlantic Canadian provinces. So what's important to note with this slide is that these are not just currently active, but these are groups that have been active over the, at some point in the 20 years. Um, Research has found that um, in Canada, groups are tending to kind of form and dissolve relatively quickly. So they form, they may be some infighting or some other reason that the group dissolves. It could be six months, it could be a year, which makes tracking them a little bit more difficult. Um, but to note is that of the 29 groups that we identified in the 20 year time span, um, there were 26 that were active between 2015 and 2019. Um, so there were 20, or, yeah, 26 had been active in kind of the recent years and 19 were specifically established after 2016. So those are high numbers in comparison to the total numbers of groups. And then I also found that 14 of these groups were active in New Brunswick or are currently active in New Brunswick today. Um, as well, it's, it's important to note that two of these groups were founded, so were created by individuals in Atlantic Canada, one in New Brunswick and one in Nova Scotia and that the rest of these groups are chapters of either other Canadian groups or other international groups. And then of the 148 individuals, these are individuals who 
lived in Atlantic Canada while embracing right wing or far right ideologies um, or conducted far right or right wing extremist activities in Atlantic Canada. And of these 148, 67 were living or are currently living in New Brunswick. So what are the really big takeaways from our research? Um, first, we found empirical support for the post-2016 boom in Canada. So it's not just happening in Canada or globally. We also see it in our quiet corner of Canada, um, in Atlantic Canada. Secondly, we found that even in the most rural parts of Canada, we're still seeing uh, an urban effect to right-wing extremism. And again, this is something that needs to be researched more to understand how and why it's happening. Um, we can speculate that maybe it's because um, urban areas are more heterogeneous. So there's more, um, there, there are more different ethnicities, there are more different, different uh, religions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which can provide more targets for far right groups. Um, it could also be that uh, urban areas are more, um, more visible. So there's more media coverage and more people if they were to hold a rally or a protest, it would be more visible in urban areas than in rural areas, which could potentially be another reason. But again, we'd have to do more research to fully understand this. And then the last takeaway from our research is that overall, right-wing extremism over the past years in New Brunswick has been remarkably nonviolent. It was only about 11% of our um, incidents that we located were violent incidents. And these were, um, these were mostly just uh, violent incidents against a minority group uh, or an individual minority kind of out of personal grievances or right-wing ideologies. But there were two mass casualty events in the 20 year period, uh, the first being Justin Bork and the second being a uh, plot to commit a mass shooting in a mall in Nova Scotia, which was thankfully thwarted before it could happen. And both of these events, both of these mass casualty events took place or would have taken place had it occurred before the po before the 2016 boom. So that one was in 2014 and one was again earlier than 2016, um, which suggests that um, right-wing extremists right now could be more focused on efforts to sway others to their cause or engaging in intimidation and harassment or in organized demonstrations than in planning and committing violence. Uh, currently, that's what these results are showing. Um, so that's the end of my portion of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, if we don't get to them and they're really pressing and you would really like an answer, you can email me. That's my contact information. Or you can email Dr. Hoffman as well. Um, and I'm just going to slide over to Shana's slides right now. And I'm hoping, Tracy, you can unmute her so she would be able to give her presentation. Thanks for listening, guys. <clears throat> OK. Uh, hi, everyone. I think I'm unmuted. I think everyone can hear me. OK. <clears throat> So as Bryn already stated, uh, I'm doing my master's research on right-wing extremism in the Canadian Armed Forces, and the information that I'm sharing with you today is part of that research. I first got introduced to this topic of right-wing extremism um, in my undergraduate degree as a research assistant, and I was also a research assistant on the information that Bryn just gave to you. Um, and since that uh, RA ship, I had really come to enjoy learning about the topic. And within the past couple of years, news has repeatedly reported on the issue of right wing extremism and some of the high profile cases of right wing extremism in the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, so this inspired me to do a research project on it to investigate the link between the two. So to date, I have conducted an extensive open source media scan on the topic as well as conducted 20 interviews with Canadian Armed Forces personnel on their experiences and perceptions of right-wing extremism in the Canadian Armed Forces. So to get started, to kind of set the scene for you all, I'll be starting off by talking about right-wing extremism in the Canadian Armed Forces more generally. <clears throat> so right-wing extremism is present within the Canadian military. Uh, in a 2018 report, the Canadian Military Police Criminal Intelligence Section identified 16 military members of extreme uh, hate groups and 35 others engaged in racist or hateful be uh, behavior. These numbers are likely higher as extremists and extremist groups are known to go to great lengths to keep their associations with extremism hidden. 
And this is a common tactic used by extremists to uh, hide their extremist identities and affiliations from others. So kind of to just contextualize the issue, I'll give a couple quick examples of right-wing extremism in the Canadian Armed Forces. So one right-wing extremist group, LEMIT, was founded by two former Canadian Armed Forces personnel. Another group, the Three Percenters, is known to have members who are active and former military and law enforcement personnel. The Three Percenters in particular are one of the more dangerous right-wing extremist groups in Canada because of their paramilitary training. And in fact, recent news reported that Canadian Armed Forces Rangers, um, there are some Canadian Armed Forces Rangers are supporters and or members of far right groups like the Three Percenters. And actually now the 4th Canadian Ranger Group Patrol, or the 4th Canadian Patrol Group, sorry, in particular is under investigation by the Department of National Defense for said accusations. So top Canadian Armed Forces officials do admit to extremism in their ranks and after increasing demand by the public and government are taking action to develop a definition for hateful conduct that will help armed forces membership to better understand, identify, respond to and report extremist actions and behaviors. So the definition for hateful conduct is now up on your screens. The Canadian Armed Forces enforced a Canadian Army order for hateful conduct applicable to all Armed Forces personnel. The intent of the Canadian Army order is to eliminate racism, discrimination, and hateful conduct in the Armed Forces. To effectively respond to the incidents of hateful conduct, Armed Forces members are required to report incidents to the proper authority who will then report to the chain of command. Uh, next slide. So certain right-wing extremists and extremist groups are drawn to the Canadian Armed Forces because both the military and the right-wing extremist culture share common elements, such as hypermasculinity, authoritarianism or a rigid hierarchy, and a need for brotherhood. And research demonstrates that it is this hyper-masculinity of both the military and the right-wing extremist groups that link the two. So here you have masculinity paired with militancy, uh, to draw in a crowd of young, usually white men. The movement is especially appealing to those armchair or weekend warriors who enjoy violence themed recreational activities like paintball, watching war movies and gun shows, or reading magazines such as The Soldier of Fortune. So on the one hand, you have right-wing extremist groups who fill a need for those military recruits who are looking for a community or a group to belong to that shares similar characteristics to the military, and on the other hand, you have these military recruits bringing in their skills and credibility to the extremist group. And these right-wing extremist groups who purposely recruit military and law enforcement personnel do so for those recruits' weapons and explosives training, leadership skills, discipline, and their access to weapons, equipment, and sensitive information. These skills and resources have the potential to increase the group's lethality and credibility within the right-wing extremist movement. More often than none, recruitment occurs on websites and social networking sites such as Facebook, Gab, and YouTube, where members often use aliases. For example, the three presenters have used social media to promote their cause to potential recruits. And some of these posts speak to youth and veterans, making reference to standing guard with our troops to protect Canadian heritage. And you can see an example of this on the slide right now in the three presenters Alberta mission statement. Uh, next slide. So Canadian popular culture is seeing an interchange between right wing extremist movement and paramilitary culture. The military is using, or sorry, the movement is using the military's cultural values as an aspect of appeal to soldiers and veterans, which you just saw on the previous slide in the Three Percenters mission statement. Um, this trend suggests that there are factors at play making extremist affiliation desirable. In addition, popular materials and activities such as magazines, articles, playing video games, or looking at or creating memes are supporting the paramilitary culture and values. Although these popular materials and activities are mainstream and legal, they pose a threat to society and could lead to danger if these armchair adventurers seek out the right-wing extremist movement and use the Canadian Armed Forces as a mean to gain real-life paramilitary training. So uh, next slide. Uh, I have two examples of right-wing extremism in the Canadian Armed Forces from within Atlantic Canada. 
Um, so the first one is the Proud Boys. The Proud Boys are a fraternal organization of Western chauvinists. The group is US based and aims to reinstate a spirit of Western chauvinism during an age of globalism and multiculturalism. Uh, they're actually now classified as a terrorist group in Canada. They prefer minimal government, are against political correctness, are pro-free speech, and are against racial guilt. They state that they will not apologize for creating the modern white world. Um, the group espouses a white nationalist, anti-Muslim, and misogynistic rhetoric. So in 2017, five members of the Canadian Armed Forces, who also called themselves Proud Boys, disrupted a Mi'kmaq ceremony in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The ceremony took place on Canada Day in front of the statue of Edward Cornwallis, where Chief Grizzly Mama cut off her braids to symbolize the scalping and mistreatment of Indigenous people. The five Armed Forces Proud Boys interrupted the ceremony by paying respect and honor to Cornwallis. They dressed in matching black and yellow or gold polo shirts and debated the Mi'kmaq's clan to, uh, claim to the land. One man in particular uh, was carrying a Canadian Red Ensign flag stating that this is a British colony. Um, the second example are the Ottomwaffen Division. This is a far-right terror group based in the U.S. The Ottomwaffen Division believes in racial cleansing and is rooted in the history of the American white power movement. Members follow a neo-Nazi accelerationism ideology, so this idea of using a certain situation or event to promote widespread chaos to ignite some sort of social change. So in these extremists' case, the social change that they're trying to move toward is the creation of a white ethno state. Accelerationists within the Ottomwaffen division favor doctrines of leaderless resistance or diffuse cell structured networks. For example, the Ottomwaffen division uses various online forums and social media platforms for recruitment and to spread propaganda and often use these pseudonyms and allies to, um, to keep their identities covert. So a former uh, Nova Scotia soldier was found on one of these online platforms under the pseudonym Elba Noir, and this soldier lived a double life as a reservist and a covert member of the Ottomwaffen Division. He primarily worked online bragging about his military status and posting prejudiced comments directed toward Black and Jewish people. Um, another Canadian Armed Forces member under the pseudonym Mikulajevic encouraged other Canadian members of the group to join their local reserves. And in fact, other users on the platform did start talking about joining the armed forces um, reserves as a low commitment way to gain access to combat training and physical conditioning. So the cases of these two Canadian Armed Forces members in particular exemplifies how members gain access to these forums and can self-radicalize online. Uh, next slide, yep. So there are other examples of right-wing extremism in the Canadian Armed Forces outside of the Atlantic Canadian context. So the picture of the kind of top picture of the gentleman there is Patrick Matthews, uh, a Manitoba reservist uh, who while serving was an active member and recruiter of a US-based right-wing extremist group known as the base. When word got out about his extremist affiliations, Matthews fled to the States where he and other base members built an illegal assault rifle and made plans to commit violent acts at a, at a pro-gun demonstration in Virginia. And he is currently incarcerated in the US and awaiting trial. The second gentleman is Corey Hearn, a Canadian Ranger, which uh, these Ranger groups are part of the reserves unit. Um, uh, he was based in Ottawa and he stormed the gates of Rideau Hall with the intent to inflict violence on the Prime, Min uh, on the Prime Minister Trudeau. Curran was also a business owner who was caught up in COVID conspiracies at the time and frustrated with COVID restrictions and the impacts they had on his business. So those are just two more examples of this, this issue of right-wing extremism in the Canadian Armed Forces. But what does this all mean? So. These, all of these examples that I've shared with you today show that right-wing extremism is an issue in the Canadian Armed Forces and if not dealt with can pose a serious threat to Canadian public safety. If these extremist groups continue to radicalize and recruit members of the Armed Forces, there is a risk that these military recruits will disseminate their military training and knowledge to these groups and increase the group's credibility and lethality. The link between right-wing extremism and the Canadian Armed Forces is a complicated and nuanced issue that will take years to overcome. 
However, the armed forces are taking the correct steps toward combating the issue with their hateful conduct policy. They are working with experts in the field of extremism to promote long lasting institutional change. So for example, if we flip to the next slide, this research was also funded by the Minds Network for research on hateful conduct and right-wing extremism in the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, this collaboration proves that this is a real issue and that that needs to be addressed from multiple perspectives in order to effectively combat it. Uh, and that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna, thank you, Shana and Bryn. Uh, so now we're gonna go to Jobert. Um, on mute. There you go. You're unmuted now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I will put uh, my timer to be sure I will not uh, surpass my time. So uh, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you today. Um, of course, I'm not English. So if my quality uh, is not good enough, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, I'm not afraid of that. I'm still learning. So uh, as um, 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 my thesis when I was in my PhD was um, about radicalization process towards violent extremism. And uh, now um, I'm working more uh, on online aid um, on political candidate in New Brunswick. And after Christmas, I start a new field on the uh, anti belleguism movement in the province because of the new events and the revision of the law this year. We saw a resurgence of that kind of uh, hateful comment online. So, uh, so I will step aside a bit of uh, what you what you read about me on the the presentation, and I will talk more about what we can saw online with the group who is against bilingualism in New Brunswick. And when you check online, uh, even on Facebook, we saw many many groups that are really focused on discussion around languages. And most of them, and if not all of them, really talk about against the fact that New Brunswick or Canada has a bilingual status between uh, with French and English. But today I want to show you talk more about uh, what we face with the Anglophone Right Association. Uh, the reason um, I want to talk about this group is because I found the group more intellectually coherent, they are more active even outside the internet. And uh, this is a public actor, so they act socially, the government is interact with them. So for me, uh, it was a, uh, a, an interesting case. And today, uh, my goal is not really to judge the movement. I don't want to, uh, I want to present the group as clear as a researcher should do and really try to understand the organization. And if some of members of Anglo society are here tonight, I hope after my presentation, they will agree with what I propose because I will try to, um, to explain why they feel the way they feel and why, uh, what is the main narrative. So technically I will present the cosmology and cosmology is it's not really an insult. Uh, each group has its narrative and imaginary that help to bring people uh, together. So I will present that in three parts. The first part will be um, what I call etiology, is what is the cost of the rupture movement? After that, I will talk about the ontology. What is the reality? Who's the actors playing in that story? And finally, I will talk about the axiology. So what is good and what is bad for them? In reality, those three have always been connected, but to better understand the movement, I separate them. Uh, so um, the following story has built in with the discord I found on the internet. I redraw and analyze with NVivo. Of course, it's not complete, it's unprecise uh, because I'm just starting to analyze that data. But I hope they will help us to discuss about the, um, the, the, the debate who's around um, the billing, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the debate was around the language. So let's start with the fall of the harder. So the story we can sum that group start like this. Long, long time ago, French was dominant in Canada. And until 1763, 
um, French uh, control all the colony. And after that, English nation conquer all of North America. So Acadian, uh, for them, Acadian was nation was not better than the English one because they were stealing Aboriginal land and forced them to speak French and wage war over religion. With time, language became a dominant language. English became a dominant language all around the world. Uh, until modern time, English and French people live in peace, helping each other. Uh, where was the conflict between them? English people were helping them to find work and learn the language. And for them, the problem start when the French elite start to be power hungry. So after the deportation in 1755, Acadian was just an imaginary great nation searching for a lost land that never really existed. So now Acadian seemed to only want to convince the victor language to give more and more until they can have back their nation. So for them, Acadian, their attention is never to share the place between the both languages, but to make all people in the province speak French. And then the fall. So Acadian elites succeed as the Quebecer did on the national level to make New Brunswick officially bilingual. And after that, all the curves on the province start. Uh, the official bilingualism status was fulfilled by, by corrupt politician and French elite working together with personal goal and an agenda to promote francophone over all other groups in the provinces. So slowly the French became the dominant minority in the province. And since that, since the constitutional law, uh, the province is downfall, is going downfall with inequality and justice and poverty. So ontology now. So the downfall continued till today, but some English speakers are not standing up to defend justice, liberty, and equality in the provinces. So who's the principal actor of that narrative? For them, we can see three types of francophone. The French was not imposing anything, the full Acadian people with the beautiful culture, dancing, singing, and make an effort to talk in English when it's time. The elite, mostly linked to the SINB that mislead francophone with false information and do not represent them. And outside of New Brunswick, the only problematic French are Quebecers, because Quebec is using its power to dominate the English minority with La Loi 101. And they saw three types of Anglophone, the corrupt politicians that know that bilingualism is wrong, but still support the law to get votes, the francophone vote, and the majority of Anglophones that are naive and do not realize yet that the bilingualism act will destroy the language and culture. And finally, the good English that people will understand by checking the fact that bilingualism act is nothing well at all for the provinces. Of course, uh, the two governments right now, uh, the provincial and the federal, are playing the game and giving all the money to SINB. Uh, to help them for their um, uh, crusade to make all the province French. So, um, in the, um, and for them, even if Anglophone uh, are get, uh, is getting the, the position of a prime minister, they're always using the bilingualism or the French uh, pleasant to get the vote and to stay in power. So, in this concept, Anglophone people should do as the Francophone Nelly did and create a group to represent the majority. And this group will be called Anglophone Rights Society. And this group will repair the injustice they face. And they present themselves as a victim for three reason, reasons. The first of those reasons is the loss of job and opportunity because of uh, the the level of bilingualism we need to work in the government, a lot of, uh, for them, a lot of English um, who's not able to speak double languages are losing jobs. Also, uh, they put that also on the increase of the debt because of duality. So share services is doubling the cost for nothing and bring the province down. And the last injustice is the, uh, the feeling that they are not able to have um, 
rational discussion in public because each time they put the issue and fact on the public, uh, the francophone elite treat them as racist, bigot, and anti-francophone. So for them, they, they, are, they, don't, they don't seem against the fact that we can learn a, a lot of languages. They just, um, they put the, the they aid the Bilingualism Act because uh, for them, they, uh, they step on liberals' values like liberty and equality between citizens, the freedom to choose the language you want. And for them, um, it, it's not equality because, they, because they're giving more to the minority. So they marginalize the Anglophone and, of course, plan to make all Canadians talk French in the future. So for them, uh, all the law um, about bilingualism is really a reverse discrimination. So it's break equality. And to solve the problem, for them, the bilingualism problem would solve itself with technology. In 100 years, we will all be able to put technology and speak and we'll be translated easily. So we don't need law, at least not a constitutional law. And uh, even if English uh, speakers are not allowed really to process, they, they don't. They feel they don't being allowed to protest. Uh, they they also need to show the truth in the public sphere. So they want to tell people the risk of putting some kind of law in the provinces. And democracy should represent the majority and not the minority. And because of that, a lot of them uh, are the People Alliance supporter because uh, the reason is because it was a not an old party, a former old party, they're probably the only one that will be uh, able to make the Greek clean up. So it's really a populist view of democracy. Democracy should represent the majority of voters. And it seemed that Francophone population in general uh, don't seem to understand the discrimination that Anglophones face. So they need to engage a new discussion with French people to explain them that they've been marginalized. So the third one, the axiology. So I call the section the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, what, is, what are good values for them? So they're really a group focusing on transparency, not deciding the law between closed door, cooperation and negotiation. They, they, they see themselves as one group they won't be equal as all of the other group in New Brunswick. So when we signed the minister about their issues, they, they just want the same place as SNB have. So for, for them, fairness is that two languages should be treated equal, very, very equal, not a law, not a cent uh, that the other group did not receive. And the, so, the slogan that we saw often is equality to the majority. So they push also for freedom of choice, not forcing anyone to talk in languages. To peace, they want to create a place that French and English work together and love each other. A democracy as a rule of majority. And all cultures should be respected and equal. And also, all people should be loyal to Canada. And they see the elite Canadian as um, a Canadian first and Canadian second. So it's a bit like a separatist or um, a traitor for them. So the bad value is when the fact are hidden. Uh, the fact we cannot tell the truth without be bullying on the public space. For them, uh, bilingualism is a bad use of tax money. Uh, SINB do the promotion of inequity and racism. It's an anglophobia. And the government is communist. They want control as Quebecer with the Loi 101. And uh, constitution is important, but the new lang new B languages act was more a political coup than the real constitution. And so on, the government should not promote any culture. Separatism is bad, as Quebec, as for Acadian. And they are against discrimination because for them, all this, those law is discriminate them. And the Francophone did not understand what Anglophone are faces. So to conclude and to bring back with the, all of discussion of tonight, as we can, uh, do we can qualify the Anglo right society as an extreme right group? And for me, it was really difficult uh, 
because it's always difficult to put group on a scale. And does the language debate discussion is one-sided politically? I'm not sure of it. So I will propose a definition and I'm sure there's other definition, but it will be my stand for tonight. Uh, for me, uh, an extremist ideology uh, is the distinction with the political normality. And in your country, we can state the normality as the liberal principle, equality, liberty, and democratic government. For me, extremists are for you are for those principles. And I was kind of surprised in my study uh, to find that the formal discourse of anglo rice society in the public, uh, is, we should not consider that as extremist. However, when we read inside of the group, um, between uh, some of their member and followers are for me without a doubt in the extreme right field. And I saw none extreme left comment on all of those groups. So technically the administrator tolerated that very abuse of languages and uh, extreme right, extreme right uh, take up stand. Um, even if publicly or formally they present their idea that for me is, should not be considered, just be considered as right, right wings, but not extreme. And of course, uh, today um, the presentation was really an unprecise view of the movement because each day I'm trying to gather new data, new data, new data, and analyzing it. So it's really from the start, and you have the chance to to enter with me in the new field I open for the next six months. So I will end my presentation here. P. I hope we can get a good discussion uh, after that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gilbert. Um, so we're going to now go to our discussant uh, panel. Um, so David Hoffman is going to start us off. Um, and I'm just going to find <laughs> David here. Um, here so uh, thank you, everyone. Merci à tous. Um, it's really uh, an honor and a, a privilege and um, uh, an interesting time to to um, be here uh, with uh, engaging with all of you and uh, um, really having having these good conversations about uh, what's really become a pervasive and um, for the I can't think of a better word other than insidious problem uh, in Atlantic Canada in Canada and, and globally in the last couple of years. And uh, there's nothing that makes me happier than um, seeing uh, a large number of the community coming out, uh, engaging in these discussions and um, uh, really uh, helping to pull some of us out of our ivory tower um, and, and uh, really uh, getting us out of that, that um, somewhat uh, or, or too often elitist uh, academic environment and, and um, actually trying to, to engage and, and um, uh, essentially uh, better our, our immediate surroundings. So uh, thank you again, merci à tous for, for uh, this opportunity. Um, as I'm going to uh, cleave back to, to what I'm used to as an academic and, and, and uh, do what I normally do when I'm uh, discussed at these types of panels and just briefly summarize um, uh, some of the major points uh, I'm sorry, Gilbert. Um, I, I, um, I'm going to focus on on Shane and oh, yeah. Bryn. Um, uh, your points are all very salient and and interesting, but I, I cannot claim uh, enough expertise to be able to comment on them um, in in a fair way. Um, although they were very interesting and very enlightening, so uh, I'm going to keep my discussant uh, um, uh, focus on on Bryn and Shana, uh, and I encourage the other discussants to to uh, highlight the. Um, uh, contributions and, and interesting work of uh, Gilbert. Um, some of the the biggest takeaways that we can we can um, uh, really begin to absorb from Shana and Bryn's presentation is that uh, right wing extremism is here in Canada. Um, it is uh, not only here in uh, Canada; it is present and growing in Atlantic Canada. Um, we've seen a marked increase in right-wing extremist ideologies, groups, and activities 
post-2016. And probably most alarmingly is we've seen um, uh, un, uh, we've seen uh, different types of, of American paramilitary movements established in Canada as of 2015, 2016, which we've never seen before. And these are the types of movements that have led to decades of violence in the US. This is a problem. And I think Shana and Bryn really did a great job of highlighting how this is a problem. Not only is, uh, is it a problem, it's a wake-up call. Uh, I think as, as Canadians, we tend to be complacent and, uh, or too complacent, and we tend to think that uh, various types of far-right extremism um, and the, the um, uh, heinous ideologies that go along with them are, are uniquely an American product. And that here in Canada, we are either above it or, or, um, or uh, it's not really an issue. Well, that's blatantly false. And uh, the, the number of, of incidents that, that Brim brought up, the, the, the high profile cases that Shana brought up in the Canadian military are just proof that uh, we cannot be complacent uh, when trying to understand and dealing and to uh, begin dealing with uh, this type of, of ideology and, and the potential for violence it has um, to everyday Canadians and uh, to uh, and and essentially the, the harm it brings to um, Canadian life in general. Um, the last takeaway, because I don't want to take too long, uh, I know time is, is precious here. Um, I'm asked very often by, by media uh, and, and uh, colleagues and uh, other people interested in right-wing extremism, what's the best way to deal with this type of problem. We have this problem. We're beginning to acknowledge this problem. We're, we're late to the game, to be honest. I saw a great comment back there. Uh, that's absolutely right. Um, that uh, the Canadian government only recently started funding uh, research on right-wing extremism. We are late to the game, but what can what can we do as Canadians to uh, confront this type of of, of hate? Uh, these types of groups that that again, as I as I mentioned, are a threat to our very uh, the Canadian way of life. My answer is is generally the same. Uh, it takes grassroots organizations, people like you, people who are interested and in people who who take the time to inform themselves, to engage in dialogue, uh, to stand up and confront these types of groups, these types of ideologies in a peaceful way. Um, violence begets violence, and the, the I'm not uh, I'm personally not a fan of Antifa and, and violent tactics. It only feeds into the uh, narrative that the far right has that they are under attack, and uh, it is not. Um, uh, I uh, unequivocally uh, believe that is not helpful. But grassroots individuals, community solidarity, and efforts to uh, clearly state to these individuals when they poke their heads out of their cockroach holes or the come crawling out of the the woodwork that we as as Canadians, we as human beings, are not going to accept these types of worldviews and these types of of, of uh, ideas. Uh, that's the best way to deal with it. And uh, again, it begins with folks like you. So uh, I want to personally thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight. Um, you're doing something um, incredibly important by becoming informed and engaging in this conversation. With that, um, I have um, I, I've been given the, the immense privilege of, of uh, bringing up several questions. But since Shane and Bryn are, are my students and I engage with them regularly with a, with a number of questions, I thought I'd rather uh, highlight some of the, the questions that I saw in the chat and uh, bring them to the forefront. Um, and uh, I, can, I can play Bren and Shana with my own questions on my own time. Um, the first question uh, that I saw uh, and, and I think is worth bringing up is uh, from Sabine Lebel. Um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sabine, um, but uh, there was interest um, in understanding how the uh, research into right-wing extremism in Canada classified or um, uh, defined uh, right-wing extremism or uh, what were the inclusion criteria for, for certain events. I know, Bryn, that um, uh, I mentioned this in the chat that you have a slide that, uh, that highlights that and um, uh, both, uh, I'd like to, to essentially cede the floor to Shana and Bryn. Um, Shana also worked on, the, on this project as well as Bryn. So um, if you can talk a little bit about uh, how and why, uh, how we classified right-wing extremism and how, we, uh, how and why we included incidents in the data set, that would be helpful. 
Yeah, absolutely. I can give it my my best go. Um, I'm not gonna share the slide again. Um, I don't want to go through that. Um, but really, when we were looking at the definition of right wing extremism, Sabin, I think you were asking more specifically about our definition of harassment, if I'm correct. Um, I think you were asking specifically about one of our coding categories. Um, but looking at right wing extremism as a whole, um, it's it's like very difficult to define right wing extremism and there's very little consensus among academics about how to define right wing extremism. So for the purpose of our project, um, we looked at right wing extremism as an umbrella term which encompassed individuals with beliefs that espouse racial, ethnic, gender or religious superiority. Um, and then further from that, we were really looking for those which could lead to behaviors that would break the law or either modify, motivate, justify or further contribute to violence. Um, so really kind of basing our definition and what we were looking for around the, the um, potential to move towards violence or the potential to move towards uh, breaking the law. That was really what we were interested in. Um, I hope that helps answer the question. Um, in terms of our coding categories, um, with the harassment and hate speech um, category, I actually pulled it up while I was waiting so I could find it for you. Um, we were looking for specifically anything, it kind of harassment and hate speech got lumped together, but we were looking for anything that was specifically listed as a hate speech or kind of hate crime. So that would have been going through the courts, but also things that didn't quite meet the threshold for a hate crime um, or weren't um, really identified by law enforcement or police services, but still had the kind of um, aspects that you would see with a hate crime. So I think you mentioned some of the, the postering events or some of the, the flags. And I, I do believe, I'd have to go back and check for certain, but I do believe that those ones fell underneath our kind of harassment hate speech category for sure. I hope that helps. Perfect, Sabine says it, it helps. Um, perfect. Uh, very quickly, where we, we collected the data from Megan. Um, uh, well, well, why don't I, why don't I pass it to the stars? Uh, Shana and Brent, do you want to talk very quickly about where we got the data from? <laughs> I'll go ahead. Um, largely, um, we we did a large, very large open source uh, media scans. Um, um, yeah, so we exhausted all our resources that we could possibly think of um, from news articles or, or news websites to uh, online library catalogs for, uh, for academic references to um, social media sites and other social networking sites. Um, Bryn, am I missing? Any we also used it? court documents. Bryn's yes. muted, unfortunately. Uh, we also used court documents and police documents where available. Uh, we did this. Um, we did this uh, essentially um, manually, uh, but we had multiple coders, and we we essentially engaged in, in a bunch of uh, validity and reliability in, uh, increasing um, uh, techniques to uh, ensure that we were exhausted as possible. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we talk about it more in the paper. I, I hate to, uh, I hate to over promote the paper, but uh, really that 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 will answer a lot of the the methodological questions. Um, so to um, uh, to continue along the lines uh, of questions or or some of the more salient questions that um, uh, I saw in the chat, but uh, I mean that are are also uh, I find personally very interesting. As uh, Richard Remy. Um, um, asked, and I think this is a very uh, interesting um, uh, conversation or debate that we can have. Um, if, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Richard, I'm, I'm going from my jotted down notes, but um, if Canada or, or in, in our particular case, New Brunswick were to see a similar um, anti-fascist uh, activities and, and energy, like in some large cities in the US, do you uh, both think that it could actually meaningfully impact or combat um, uh, the the growth or um, I, I guess the normalization of far right ideas in New Brunswick? Um, and that's a really good question. Um, and I think we had talked, Dr. Hoffman and I, a little bit about this uh, yesterday or the day before. Um, and first of all, this kind of 
Antifa as a group, I think, can be problematic, as Dr. Hoffman mentioned. Um, but when you look in terms of counter protests or demonstrating that we don't agree with the rhetoric being presented or that we don't agree with really what's being said or the values that these groups have. Um, Dr. Hoffman mentioned um, that in, I think it was Montreal, Dr. Hoffman, you can correct me if I'm wrong, has seen lower. Um, Winnipeg. Winnipeg. Winnipeg, but you were just talking about one had seen lower oh. because they got pushed out to Quebec. Is that what yes. you remember that? Yes. Yeah. So you're saying that Montreal has seen lower right wing extremist events and incidents. Um, and one thing that Dr. Hoffman was attributing that to is that they had a growth in kind of a counter protest movement to the groups. So in response, uh, these groups have kind of moved out of Montreal because they weren't kind of they were combated their 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 attempts to kind of spread their message were, were stopped and slowed by these counter protest movements. Um, and then that kind of moved in more to a Quebec City area. So that's not really Atlantic Canada based, but it, it is kind of showing that when you are able to kind of demonstrate to these groups that we don't agree with their values, and we don't want that kind of rhetoric in our province or in Atlantic Canada, that it could be very helpful. And someone mentioned that Antifa isn't a group, you are correct, Antifa isn't a group in a whole, it's more like a movement thing. But yeah, it is, the, the whole entire concept of Antifa as a group is right wing propaganda. It's easier to hate a group than a movement. Uh, or I'm, I, it's easier to hate a, a, an organization than, than a diffuse movement. So uh, that is absolutely a, a, a proper um, a proper distinction. Um, uh, a question for Shana. Um, Shana, uh, based upon your expertise, and uh, I know you've done uh, dozens of interviews with um, Canadian Armed Forces members, um, should Canadians, Atlantic Canadians, be concerned about uh, the possibility of, of um, uh, right-wing extremist violence from members of the Canadian Armed Forces here in the Maritimes? I'm giving her an unfair question because... Thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, here in New Brunswick, you said? In Atlantic Canada. In Atlantic Canada. I... I do. I know we haven't seen it as presently as I know 2017 through mid late 2019 was kind of like the hotbed of where all the news, the, the reports were coming out for, especially for the cases that I even just talked about today. But, and like I said in my presentation, all of those cases, except for Matthews and Heron, we're in Atlantic Canada. So it is very possible. These groups are somehow through their propaganda, through these online forums, they're getting a hold of these, these uh, CAF personnel who are online in their own time and who can self-radicalize and kind of in some way relate to this movement and unfortunately, make a choice to either join this group and then disseminate their military skills and knowledge to the group, which, like I said, really does pose a threat to Canada public safety and, and the, the, the threat for violent acts against uh, Canadians or, or certain groups of Canadians on behalf of these right-wing extremist groups. I think it ab absolutely can be a threat, yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Shana. Thank you, Bryn, um, again, for your, your time and expertise. Um, thank you, David, for your comments. Uh, uh, so we're now going to go to Serge Brideau, who's the Vice President of Société de la Cadie de New Brunswick, SAMB. Um, I'm just going to unmute Serge. Um, Bonsoir. Uh, hello. Uh, well, uh, my name is uh, Serge Brido. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I am the Vice President of uh, Société Acadienne de Nouveau-Brunswick, the SANB, which is a political governance structure of the Acadian and Francophone living in New Brunswick. Very happy to be here today and participating in uh, what uh, it is a very interesting, uh, important topic. Uh, as uh, you said in the introduction, uh, the SNB helped uh, and me co -op, media co-op to organize this event, uh, which is uh, not our last partnership uh, between us. And um, I thank you everybody from the panel for uh, all the information and all the interesting observations tonight. Merci beaucoup.
Merci, Serge. Um, so now I'm going to go to Husoni Raymond, who's with Black Lives Matter Fredericton. I'm just going to unmute Husoni. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much um, for the presentations and for inviting me here. Um, I'll keep my comments brief. I did write down some questions, but as soon as I wrote them down, um, the subsequent slides kind of address them. So um, I think it was a really informative uh, presentation. Um, but I guess first, what I what I'd say or my my initial comment is that um, not so surprised by the prevalence of white extremist groups or right right wing extremist groups um, in the Atlantic provinces or in Canada in general. While it's a common kind of perception or facade that you know this kind of um, right-wing extremism does not exist in Canada, we have to remember that the legacy of Canada, Canada itself was born out of um, kind of these same type of rhetoric, the same type of rhetoric um, of, you know, racial superiority um, and, and patriarchy, et cetera. So all of these values that we see in these groups are kind of the foundation of the, the Canadian state in some way. And uh, that initial ob observation was kind of um, further solidified when we went to the part of the um, presentation talking about the correlation between um, white, uh, I keep saying white supremacist groups, right wing, um, right wing, right wing extremist groups and um, the Canadian military. Um, and I thought that was an interesting um, finding and the rhetoric of uh, protect Canadian heritage and how that translates to, you know, protecting um, white supremacy and, um, you know, protecting, you know, what we consider to be Canadian um, culture, or the ideal Canadian values, which are basically um, whiteness and Eurocentric, uh, Eurocentric values and protecting Canada from uh, racialized people. Um, so I thought that was an, an interesting point and how, you know, the military, um, these groups are given legitimacy through uh, the military or through the state. Um, and then it's no surprise why there's so much state, state violence against um, racialized people, uh, because a lot of people within the military have um, these kind of uh, right wing um, values and, and perceptions. So I think um, I, I really like the recommendations related to what the Canadian Armed Forces is doing to combat right-wing extremism, but I think that it needs a more um, radical approach in the fact that um, no matter what, you'll still have people like this um, within the, the, the force, they'll, they'll, they will be joining the, the armed forces to equip themselves with um, the weapons and the authority and the legitimacy needed to um, enact violence against racialized communities. So um, it needs to go beyond just the policy or um, beyond just uh, some kind of training or sensitization thing and into um, you know, how can we protect um, marginalized groups from the people within, um, within the, the police forces, within the armed forces, within the RCMP, et cetera. And the answer to that is reducing the scope um, of these organizations, um, reducing the scope of these organizations to allow greater independence within racialized community to determine um, their own safety and investing um, in these communities to keep them themselves safe rather than um, bringing in these uh, agents of the state which have the legitimacy to harm racialized people and oftentimes get away with it with no repercussions. Um, my other thought would be I think my other thought would be an interesting thing that came up in, in, in the conversation as it relates to Antifa and um, protests from, you know, the radical left or radical left in quote, in quote quotations or the left versus um, the right and how to adequately address 
um, right-wing extremism within um, or communities. Um, and I think one common rhetoric is that, you know, the left is often um, seen as, you know, the people who are causing trouble or who want um, trouble, they're disrupting the, the social norms and their pro protests are um, characterized as violent. And oftentimes they're, they're, these um, kind of demonstrations might even be um, co-opted by, by groups, um, right-wing groups, but we often then, it's easy for the white majority to sympathize with um, right-wing extremist groups, you know, thinking about where they're coming from, oh, um, the kind of concept of reverse racism and how they feel similar to what Gilbert was saying um, as it relates to um, anti-Francophone groups around, you know, now racialized people are getting opportunities, so that affects their opportunities, et cetera. Um, and a lot of that rhetoric is, is, is promoted and easily kind of understood by the, the white majority, which gives them even more legitimacy. So I think it is um, important for people to um, kind of like stand, stand against um, right-wing extremism in all its forms um, everywhere you see it being able to take a stand and make sure it's, it's clear that um, that kind of uh, ideologies and rhetoric um, is not acceptable. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out was related to, you know, the hidden nature of, of these um, groups, how they legitimize themselves within the state, um, but they won't openly share their values, but they still hold these values, which um, perpetuates this facade of it not being there. But as this research has discovered, um, it's just a good um, cover up. So on, on the face, it might seem like, yes, there's no racism, there's no right-wing extremism it, within um, the, the, you know, branches of the state, but they, it's actually there and they can enact their extremism in more subtle ways um, that is not just in your, that is not in your face, but can still have impact on um, mar marginalized groups. Um, and I think um, that would be the, actually, yes, I have one question, which, which is kind of the, um, freedom of speech debate, and I know my position on this, but I'd be interested in hearing um, the panelist position um, as it relates to if you kind of suppress, not suppress, but um, not give these people a platform, um, kind of, you know, shut them down as soon as you, you hear these rhetorics, won't that brew it, um, kind of shove it underground which it's harder to detect and harder to address. So on the contrary, would it be better to, um, you know, allow this kind of um, conversations and, and so it's actually exposed and in there in the public so they can be kind of discourse and um, then come up with, with solutions. Um, are you willing to hear uh, what the panelists think about that? Sorry if my internet cut out a while ago. I said um, I finished the question. I say I will um, probably comment on it after, but I wanted I want to hear what the panelists have to say um, first. Okay, so or if there's a balance. Sorry, go ahead. I just unmuted Shana Bran and uh, Gilbert's mics. So if one of you want to uh, comment on on Husoni's comment, sorry. Uh, you can go first. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, I feel like that's a really good question for you. <laughs> I, I've been asked this question a billion times by media folks. <laughs> exactly. I have a road answer ready. But, uh, um, uh, why don't we, Gilbert, why don't we see what you have to say? Um, I don't want to take a political stand because uh, I'm not here to write my own manifest or ideology book, maybe one day. But uh, what I saw in radicalization research is, is not an easy answer. If we saw on, for instance, China, 
uh, stopping people from Hong Kong talking. Uh, if you remember Arab Spring uh, or the Good Movement, they tried to shut down the idea. They tried to break people motivation, but sometimes it's not working well. And even if it's underground, a lot of movement fortify themselves underground because they have a, a good legitimacy of we've been threat to they really against us and they run force them. So sometimes I, I think it's just a, a little blanket on the problem so we can forget it for 10 years and after that say, whoa, they were there and we're all kind of surprised, but they were always there. But uh, seriously, in the literature, we, are, we don't have, I think we don't have a good answer to that question. No, we don't have a good answer to that question. <laughs> it, it, it's it's, it's uh, the rock in a hard place question, and it's very hard to answer. Um, this is one of the few few places I'll stick my neck out. Uh, and I, I agree with Gilbert, it's sometimes hard to take a political stance, but I do stick my neck out here. Um, in the, and I say that um, deplatforming hate and deplatforming far right um, uh, speech is important. Um, uh, I, I, it came up in the chat uh, conversation a little bit before, uh, largely because um, it's hard to engage with with uh, in an intellectual debate with someone who debates in bad faith. Um, they use a, a number of tactics like gish galloping and, and uh, straw man arguments and, and other very common logical fallacies to twist and to uh, um, uh, mutate arguments to to um, basically prove whatever points uh, they want, and uh, essentially it gets it gets nowhere. All that ends up uh, happening is that these people get a platform uh, and a very very uh, far reaching platform to share their ideas and attract people who um, uh, who I, I hate to, to um, question people's you know intelligence or anything, but people who who might be susceptible to uh, this type of rhetoric or, or who don't have the critical fa uh, uh, faculties to deal with uh, understanding, you know, not everything on the internet is true. So um, uh, it, it is important and, and I, I completely, and this is a, a personal um, uh, opinion, I, I think deplatforming these types of things is, is incredibly helpful, even though as a researcher, it actually, it harms uh, it is a bad thing as a researcher because then we, we, you know, a, a big chunk of our data is now gone. But I, I think it's more important that we uh, that we uh, don't give them a platform. Jaber, did you want to respond to that too? No, uh, it's fine. I made my case. Uh, uh, the, probably just saying that uh, we are facing something new, and the last twenty years is uh, it's been called the internet. And for us, we are we kind of born with it, in it, but. Uh, for research is kind of tough because um, we are dealing with social network that is not a natural form of communication. Uh, usually we're, we're able to, we are not as extreme with friends that we can be on the internet and that poses a problem because the internet, you don't care if you shock someone or you're hiding between anonymity and it's very new for researcher to understand of this uh, echo chamber uh, group who ate and grew with bad faith work because before that they were they were in social life they they, they were more uh, able to see that in her community and more able to talk and it's really changed the game and we, we need to take the technology in consideration okay thank you um so we're going to go to our last discussion who is uh, ron tremblay and then we'll go to your, your question. So Ron, did you want to comment now? Hey, uh, uh, Lehman, uh, I want to thank the presenters for, uh, for your words of uh, great, great knowledge and, and, and research. Um, um, I, I have quite a few things to respond to and to say. And, to help you put things in perspective from the um, the view from the shore, per se, um, in in 1604, um, you know, our people were on the shore, and there was these boats coming in. So um, your view is from the boat, and my view is from the shore. 
as the you know the uh, the first people of this land. Um, we have um, a quite um, detailed creation story that described how the Wabanaki were created and how life was created. Um, and, and it takes um, three days to tell. It, it's that long of a creation story. It, it's not um, biting the apple or, or taking um, um, a rib from a man. It, it's more uh, in, you know, um, detailed than that and it's more broader than that. And it really describes who we are uh, as Wabanagi and, and this um, confederation that we belong to is that um, there's, there's five, five uh, East Northern Wabanagi nations that are um, the Passamaquoddy, the Penobscot, the Abenagi, the Mi'kmaq, and the Wallistog. And when we were created and, and when we came onto this land, we were given certain um, um, responsibilities. And because of the um, settlers who came here, it, it, it kind of um, broke away our, and, and, and it created this delusion and, and illusions of, of uh, another way of life. So, so we, we strayed away from our um, initial in, in instructions and, and our, um, what we call our wampum laws. So I, I wanna put that in uh, um, um, perspective and to share what uh, one of the grandmothers, Alma Brooks of, of the Western Nation says, Colonial, uh, colonialization did not start here. It, it was mastered in Europe first, then they came here. So this right wing extremists were actually created and, and was rooted and was developed in Europe. Then they came here. And that's what we're seeing today. Um, you know, they want to conquer, they want to rape the land, they want to um, demise and, and deflate, you know, any uh, person of color. And, and, and that's their goal. And, and that's why they feel that they're supreme is because, you know, it's, it, and, 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 and that runs through um, the DNA and, and of, of these um, right-wing um, groups. And um, yeah, I guess I wanna read. So when these right, right-wing groups came here in, in 1604, they, they eventually swept across what we know today as North North America. So as, as Pasoni said, it, it, it was, that was the, uh, the birth of, of it here, here originally. So that's why it, it swept across North, North um, America and, and these seeds just flourished. And they, um, and, and I wish I could show you the map of all the indigenous nations prior to 1492. Uh, they had their own distinct um, homelands. And, and then within three, you know, with, within a couple of centuries, of, you know, our lands were eventually taken away and so on. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the two official um, languages here in, in our province. And, you know, um, the first thing that was done when these colonizers came to our land was they renamed all the river systems and, and they renamed all the landmarks. And rather be, you know, uh, you know after, uh, you know, Sir Frederick for Fredericton, and, and Saint Jean the Baptist for our our beautiful river. So that's the first thing they did. Is they renamed all our sacred rivers and our brooks and our lakes and and our landmarks. 
So this is this this again shows that right wing extremist um, uh, position it, is that they were here again to conquer and to steal our lands and, and our resources. And, and we can't forget you know, the, that there was an original languages here already. You know, the Mi'kmaq, you know, uh, the Wolostuk and, and the Passamaquoddy here in, in this province of New Brunswick. So, um, so like listening to all of the, uh, the presenters, um, if, you know, I have to um, speak the truth from the view from the shore. And, and I, I hope I did not uh, offend nobody, but you know, I want to uh, present to the eyes and through the um, mind of, of the first people. And, and like uh, Gilbert, um, that uh, it, um, the English language is my second language. So I too struggle speaking and, and grabbing words from the English language. So, um, so I wanna thank you and uh, Thank you, Ron. Um, I, I want to give them, does the, the panelists have anything to respond to that? Uh, Gilbert, do you want to go? Um, I want to take my uh, former study in political ideology hat to answer that question because for me, uh, 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 Monsieur Tremblay is a uh, is touching probably the, the sensible chord of, of the, the European civilization or even the history of humanity for me. Uh, because uh, when you read history, uh, um, I don't know how people can study history all their life because it's not always fun to read. Um, and what we saw is we always fight, the, even the Francophone, even the uh, right wings is always the same thing. It's always a fight on resources, who's getting the resources and fight on reality. So it could be a religion, an ideology of a set of value, but you want to impose them to other because it's reality for, for, for you, it's reality. And, and I'm still impressed that if we look on stories, we're just getting better for the last 50 years before our death. It, is why quite horrible everywhere on the globe, and and uh, I'm I'm still thinking of um, our Acadian friend uh, Vautour that has been expropriated. He's, he's died last week, and I still heard people and French people saying, "Come, oh, the government has the right to expropriate people." Jackie, the logic is still there. We are able to take the land when it's not yours. We able to change the name. We able to do it. If you have good value, it's okay. But good value change in time. And if we're not able to, to, to set principle to guide each individual resources and believe, we're we stuck there and it will be stuck there. Uh, and for me and Monsieur Tremblay, understand that, that we kind of stuck with the same logic. And maybe it's good now, but if we change government, it could be bad at worst. <laughs> And, and now we, we need to think about which kind of principle that we want to share. What, what is the reality? And, and, and for, for me, uh, it's kind of discussion that social society must have and not the really researcher. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much to our presenters and our discussants for all your insights tonight.